morning, um, <clears throat> Your Excellencies, Madam Minister, Mr. Speaker, uh, friends. Uh, it is my great uh, honour and privilege to be here um, and to uh, open, uh, together with uh, the ministers, such an important uh, meeting. We stand a particular fork in the road. Um, the international effort over the last few years has been concentrated on reaching a quite remarkable set of agreements last year on the pathway forward for sustainable development, the agreement, the universal agreement on 17 sustainable development goals, at the heart of which are goals around sustainable energy, the precursor to the kinds of green growth, equitable growth that the minister was referring to. Uh, an agreement on how, in theory, this should be paid for, the prudent generation of domestic resources, open and transparent tax systems directed towards development priorities, revenues directed towards development priorities, in an Addis Ababa agreement earlier last year, culminating in a remarkable agreement in Paris in December, which as your president described to me yesterday when I met him, uh, was in fact a renewable energy conference, Adnan. Um, a remarkable agreement in Paris of true ambition that we will try to build a global economy that is in balance with the Earth's chemistry and where we can prosper, where we can leave no one behind and that we can do so aiming to uh, stabilize emissions in a way in which brings us way below two degrees of warming. It was an ambition that many walking into Paris didn't think that we could find within ourselves. And so now, at this point in time, as you sit here in Reykjavik, the challenge for you, for us, is how do we make it possible community by community, city by city, country by country, to realize an economic growth which is more equitable, and Iceland has a story to tell about that, that is clean, therefore just. Um, and how do we do that quickly? Because the one thing that we don't have on our side is time. We have technology, we have know-how, we have examples. We don't have time. We have to engineer a energy transition globally in very little time if we are to be serious about what we committed to each other to do in the Sustainable Development Goals last year and in the Paris Agreement. The G7 last year talked about an energy economy by 2050 that would be zero net emissions. Paris said we should come in way below two degrees. We still have 1.1 billion people who don't have access to electricity and power. We still have almost three billion people, mainly women and children, who don't even have access to clean cooking. So the choice that they face is cook a meal and poison my child. This is criminal in 2016. So how are we going to arrive at a world where our energy systems support the kind of economic diversification that we can see here in Iceland? Where our energy systems support the kind of clean air that cities need in order to be competitive and to create the jobs that are needed for a growing population? How can we turn the ship of fossil fuel oriented energy policies to one that is cleaner and affordable and feasible, practical, operable, as the title of this conference shows, and how can we do so quickly? So it's right that we're all here in Reykjavik. Small country, big story to tell. Small country, huge resilience in more than one way. So it's right that we're here to really focus in on this. It strikes me that when we look at the story of geothermal, 
we can see extraordinary technological advance, bringing the possibility of geothermal energies exploitation in all of its different dimensions, uh, bringing it within grasp of communities and countries all around the world. And the partnership between Iceland and the countries of the Rift Valley stands as an example of the promise that this holds. But what's interesting to me in 2016 is that we're still talking about the promise. If we look at the rates of investment flowing into geothermal last year, or 2014, for which num years we have numbers for, compared to the amount of investment flowing into solar, for example, solar dwarfs geothermal. And yet geothermal is an attractive, it would, it would seem on paper, sensible, um, clean, abundant use of practical power for many countries around the world. And so if technologically and geologically, scientifically, we can see that that option is there, then the work that many of you are engaged in, in terms of understanding what the policy and financial barriers are to the taking off of geothermal more broadly, will be very important. It's also, I think, important to pick up on the last, one of the last comments that the Minister made, which is that we are, an in sustainable energy for all and working with the Secretary General to make sure that this initiative drives action forward, we are very focused on the access gap and those countries for whom the transition of the next 10, 20 years is not just a transition to cleaner energy but a transition to actually having reliable, sustainable power at all. That in addition to our focus on developing countries and their real and pressing needs for an energy system that will allow them to grow green, there is a remarkable opportunity for geothermal in the cities of the developed world. And we have to, at the same time, remember that our pursuit of an energy transition demands a revolution in energy efficiency, in energy productivity, for which geothermal would seem to be uh, an, an interesting option for, for many cities and countries in the developed world as well. In Sustainable Energy for All, therefore, we have pivoted from uh, a few years of remarkable advocacy together with Iceland and many other countries around the world, together with companies from the renewable energy sector through to the traditional energy sector, through to um, the new business models that are emerging in the future provision of energy services, uh, together with civil society, together with the scientific community and academics, we are emerging from a few years of remarkable advocacy that it is possible to close the energy access gap, to end energy poverty, that we can do so cleanly and affordably, and that we can engineer a revolution in energy productivity at the same time, and that we must do so to have a chance of realizing the world that Paris imagines, to have a chance of realizing the Sustainable Development Goals. We have pivoted away then from that advocacy to our focus now on what will it take to get things done, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, country by country, city by city. And obviously when we stand back and analyze the world from an energy productivity standpoint, from a energy poverty standpoint, there are places in the world where if we don't make progress, we will not reach the kinds of commitments we made to each other last year. Energy access across sub-Saharan Africa, energy access in South Asia, parts of Southeast Asia, the opportunities for clean energy in small islands around the world. These are places where we need to see a, a stepped up action over the next few years. Energy productivity in uh, Eastern Europe and the stands in some of the big, fast industrialising countries. And frankly, a much greater level of ambition even here in Europe, where traditionally Europe has led, and despite the distractions of a particularly t of the particular turmoil politically at the moment, Europe still has to lead. We still need Europe to lead. So as we focus on the practical actions necessary, we are focused on leaders, 
because the kind of transition that we need requires leadership. It requires politicians to make a bet. It requires bipartisan coalitions to build energy transitions that will go beyond one electoral cycle. It will require mayors to gather together the forces of, uh, of support and investment to allow a city to make a long-term bet. It will require community leaders to step forward. It will require business leaders to resist the short-termism that paralyzes so many companies and organize shareholders and, and workforces for the, the future that they see. I was deeply honored yesterday to meet with Bjarne Bjarnason from uh, Reykjavik Energy and listen to his story of, of geothermal in this country and the impact geothermal has had on the ability of GDP to, to, to increase systematically. But what struck me even more about him was the story of his career, that he had worked in almost every aspect of the energy business in one way or another. He knew the business from every possible facet, understood what it does to an economy. And now, at this particular point in his career, had turned his attention to diversity in his workforce and had turned his attention to how much more productive his workforce could be and his company could be, how much more successful his company could be if it were diverse, if there were you know, equal numbers of women and men in management, in technical teams. I would like to clone Bjarni Bjarnason and I would like to take him all around the world. I would like to put him in front of investment managers in London and New York and Singapore and Shanghai. And I would like to have him talk to the investors in the future energy economy about the fact that the energy companies of this energy economy will have to look and be very different in the future than they are now if we are to have an energy system that will be very different in the future than it is now. The energy, the energy industry, the energy services industry is the least diverse of any sector of the economy. How possibly can such a small sliver of humanity guide one of the most remarkable transitions that we have ever thought about, let alone planned for, and expect that at the end of it, it will be different. We need different voices, different minds. We need the whole of humanity's ingenuity, planning and working through this energy transition. So we will work with leaders, women and men. We will broker partnerships and broker the conversations that don't take place. The phone call from ministers, from businessmen in Iceland, perhaps under the auspices of the World Geothermal Alliance, to the policymaker in another country that faces a difficult decision. And the experience, the direct experience of being directly elected but making a long-term decision and, and taking the bet and how to galvanize public support for that decision over a short-term, perhaps less clean choice. We have to help each other. So we will empower leaders, we will um, broker partnerships, broker conversations, and we will work on the unlocking of the finance. I'm delighted that my former colleagues at the World Bank through ESMAP are doing so much to bring together financing that will help risk share and help take down the costs of that upfront investment in geothermal exploration. This is a very necessary de-risking of the business for those who want to pursue it. And we need more of this. So unlocking the finance remains something that we will focus on even more. And to do that, we will marshal the evidence. We need the data, we need the evidence, we need the numbers that show why you would choose this path over another. We will benchmark progress. Nothing spurs the creative juices of a businessman, businesswoman, or an elected leader more than knowing that there was an elected leader just close by who did something differently and got a better result. Benchmarking progress will be a way to create a race to the top faster than we have at the moment. So if we marshal the evidence and benchmark progress, the last piece that we will engage in as SE4ALL is to tell stories. 
to tell the stories that allow us to imagine that this transition is possible, that Iceland is possible elsewhere in the world, that it is possible to have clean energy, diversify the economy, produce jobs, create opportunity, and that that future is one where we will be better off, not one where we are asking some to sacrifice. Asking people to give something up is, is a hard sell. Asking people to imagine collectively that they can be better off is an important story that has to be told. And so I'm constantly interested in why good news doesn't travel. And I think telling stories of success, telling Iceland's story, taking Bjarni Bjarnason around the world or cloning him, these are the kinds of things that SE for All will do. So I am delighted to be here. Um, I want you to know that we hope that we will be the platform that will help you um, spur forward geothermal technology to a place where it can provide the kind of long-term solutions that it has for Iceland over the last 60 to 70 years. And that this is uh, technologically within reach, and so we must remove the policy and financial barriers to having this truly be realized for all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.